Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to have uh, this wonderful and knowledgeable group of experts. And I'm quite sure that we're going to learn a lot uh, with them on the issue of uh, uh, child online protection. And uh, we have organized this panel in two parts. In the first one, we are going to listen from our experts uh, the most recent uh, reports that uh, was conducted globally by UNICEF. So we are going to have um, the Global Kids Online Report that was prepared by UNICEF, Innocenti Research Center in Italy. Uh, then we are going to have the European Kids Online Report, of course, focusing on European countries. And then we are going to have the Online Kids Online Latin America Report. So this is the first part of this uh, panel. We are going to see results and the main findings from these uh, different regions. So it is very nice that we have uh, uh, speakers from different uh, countries, different regions, but uh, with a single and common methodological framework, which is the Kids Online uh, framework. In the second part of the panel, we will encourage the debate on the implications of data and evidence for policymaking in this field of children's rights. Uh, and then I will try to save some time uh, after do the two parts so that we can have some time for question and answers. And uh, because of, uh, we don't have much time and so many uh, speakers, I will be very strict with the time. I will give you about eight minutes, 10 minutes maximum. And uh, before giving the floor to these wonderful speakers, I'd like to make some reflections about how the expansion of the internet 
in particular through mobile devices, which is a reality in many, many countries, especially in the global south. In Brazil, for instance, the country that I come from, uh, mobile became the most important device to access the internet. And of course, that uh, this uh, uh, posed some issues. And this expansion, particularly from mobile devices, has intensified the possibilities for socialization, for participation, for access and search for information, entertainment, etc. And of course, that this intensive adoption of internet by our children creates a wide range of new possibilities, new opportunities, but at the same time, it also poses new challenges and responsibilities for parents, educators, in terms of ensuring rights and well-being of our children in this digital age. So we are talking about a very important topic. From the perspective of children's rights, I would like to recall that this year, 2019, we are celebrating 30 years of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, adopted by UN, as you know. And this celebration uh, is an important event, which, by the way, was broadly ratified by countries worldwide. So it is an opportunity for us to take stock of the advances and challenges to protect and to promote participation of children in an increasingly digital society. And finally, I believe that the transformation caused by the dissemination of digital technologies requires that policymakers, the pri private sector, the industry, ICT industry, and also to civil society organizations that have a relevant voice in the policy de debate to reaffirm their commitment to treat children's rights as an absolute priority. So I think that uh, with that, I would like to highlight the importance of this uh, session, of this debate. And of course, uh, needless to say, the importance of producing quality and reliable data to input in the policy making process. And with that, uh, in our first uh, part of this panel, I think that it's a kind of setting the scene for the debate on policy. So, uh, and today is also a very special day because we are launching uh, those regional reports. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Daniel Kaderfeld Winter from the UNICEF Office of Research in Ocente that will give us a broad uh, view of this um, uh, report prepared by UNICEF. So Daniel, we have the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alexander. And good morning, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here both, of course, to talk about the report we're launching today, which you can actually find at the very back of the room. Uh, but also to talk about the work of the Global Kids Online Network broadly, as well as our um, sister networks in Latin America and Europe. And I'm very pleased to be doing this together with so many of my colleagues who have been working together on this for, for many years. Um, can we get the PowerPoint up um, so that we can... Oh, perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk just briefly about the Global Kids Online Network. This is an initiative that we started, um, UNICEF's Office of Research, together with the London School of Economics and the EU Kids Online Network, about four years ago, because we saw that the evidence base on children's digital um, experiences was not, um, it's not really strong enough in many countries around the world to guide policy and practice. Let me see if this works. And so we established a research network with the purpose of producing high quality evidence on children's digital experiences. Um, and we developed together with our colleagues um, a standardized toolkit of uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, methodologies. And the really interesting thing about this methodology is that I think it, it kind of um, signifies best practice in, in research because what we did was that we took the very high quality methodology developed by the EU Kids Online Network, and you'll hear more about that later, 
Um, and we tried to bring that to, to countries outside of Europe. We tried to improve on it to make sure that what we did built on the best possible foundation. And then in turn, um, last year, the EU Kids Online Network built on the methodology that we had then refined and made it even better. So it's a really good example of kind of iteratively improving on research. And it's been a fantastic experience because it's been so full of uh, you know, positive collaboration. Uh, there has been no you know, competition. We're all striving for the same thing. And I think that's, that's been a really powerful um, experience. And we have produced high quality evidence as a result. So the Global Kids Online project has been implemented in about 18 countries. We've reached about 25,000 children since 2016. Um, you can roughly see here uh, the countries where we work, although this, um, more countries keep joining the network, so this is always a little bit outdated. Um, and for the report that we're launching now, uh, we're using data from 11 countries. It's about 15,000 children, internet-using children, aged 9 to 17. And you can see the, the countries listed at the bottom. Uh, and we, we wanted to do a, a first comparative look across these 11 countries to pull out some of the main patterns and uh, some uh, trends that we see in, in the data. Um, and I will leave it to uh, my colleague Sonia Livingstone to talk about what we learned from, from speaking to children uh, around the world about their digital experiences. Well, uh, just to mention that uh, Sonia Livingstone, since uh, very, very many, many years, is leading this initiative. And um, outside Europe, Brazil was the first country to implement kids online methodology, and we have been doing that for um, eight years now on a yearly basis. So, uh, Sonia, I would uh, like to hear from you your comments on this uh, Global Kids Online report. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alessandra and uh, Daniel and uh, colleagues here. Um, this has been, as Daniel said, an extraordinarily collaborative enterprise involving many people in many countries and many experts and indeed many children. So in my few minutes today, I'm really going to pull out some of the highlights of the findings from our 11 country comparison and you can read more uh, in the report that we've put at the back of the room and even more in the full report which we've put on the Global Kids Online website, uh, which, because we have asked as many questions as we could possibly ask of children, in fact, as many as one can ask a child before really they would like to go and do something else. So <laughs> they, they, they provide the, uh, the opportunity and the limit. So we think of the um, nature of children's experiences online um, in a series of kind of categories, and we begin with the question of the access that they have to the internet, which is still an absolutely crucial issue in very many parts of the world. And then from questions of access, we really want to understand what are the activities that they engage with. And I think uh, for many in the internet governance world, where we began by thinking about managing and governing internet in terms of uh, desktop computers, it's the, the key finding first is the very important nature of mobile phones and mobile phones, especially for children. Um, we still ask about other devices, but there are, there are questions still to be uh, pursued about the quality of access and the, what it is that one can really do on a phone. Um, but as you can see in the summary, mobile phones are the most popular devices and home is the most popular place. And many people will talk about the responsibility of parents and we explore that in our research precisely because home is the number one place where children go online. And school use, we can see, is increasing in many parts of the world, um, already very high in some parts of the world, less so in others. Um, and there is clearly an issue for many uh, countries about how early school use should begin. Um, and so we see many children using school, um, internet in school at secondary level, fewer at primary level. When it comes to what children do, uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about why children so much love videos, gaming, uh, chatting, the kind of the entertainment activities. And we're going to make an argument about how those things are important, not simply to be restricted as somehow time wasting. Um, and then we've given some thought. We ask a lot of questions about access, um, but we also ask about all the 
things which are to do with child rights. So how much children um, use uh, digital media, use the internet to uh, seek for information, as is their right under the convention, uh, for civic engagement and to express their um, expression and uh, civil rights and liberties, um, including uh, looking for health information, looking for news, and so forth. And here we see this is more older children. And there I would raise some questions about how much we want younger children also to be engaged in uh, the full range of possibilities online. So we've conceived um, within the, the network of a kind of a ladder of online participation. And we put up a, a, a schematic of this ladder um, here so that you can get a sense of how when f children first gain access to the internet, most often they play games, they watch videos, they chat. It takes some time, both developmentally, as they get older, and also in the uh, country, as the internet becomes more familiar, for children to become more active online in terms of posting comments, looking for health information, talking to family and friends who were far away from them, and looking for news. We have, these are indicators, if you like, of the kinds of activities, and the reason we place these as a ladder is that the evidence supports the idea that the bottom rungs are more popular, especially among younger children, and also because we want to raise these questions about where do we want children to go. So we're trying to use the, the nature of the evidence to raise some questions about what do we want children to be doing online in a normative sense, as well as showing you what they are doing in an empirical sense. And particularly, we um, uh, propose as a hypothesis the idea that it is those bottom rungs, learning, chatting, um, watching videos, which enables children to develop the digital skills to go further up the ladder. And um, we make this point in the context in which in many countries there are anxieties about children's screen time, how long they're spending online, and um, whether they should be banned from certain activities, especially in school. So, we're, so here is our, our hypothesis, if you like. They need those early activities to climb the ladder to, many, to fulfill and exercise many of their rights online. Across the project, um, Global Kids Online, also EU Kids Online, also Latin American Kids Online. Um, we always think in terms of opportunities and risks. We've tried to put the opportunities first, but of course we also ask many questions about risks and the skills that children are developing, which allows them both to access the opportunities and also, we hope, to mitigate against the risks. So in the survey, we asked a number of questions about different kinds of skills that children have. These are, of course, self-reported, but we've done some effort at validation to see if children really do have the skills that they claim. And uh, just a couple of bullet points here, you can see that children have learned more about managing their privacy online, perhaps because many adults have been concerned to encourage them and are, let, are still struggling with the problem of misinformation, perhaps because adults are also struggling with these questions. And then we have a lot of uh, findings about different kinds of risk online and the uh, relationship between the activities and the risks. And perhaps here is the key challenge for policymakers, which is that those who encounter more opportunities also encounter more risks, that the two really go hand in hand. The more children do online, the more they get a full range of experiences, positive and problematic. And before I present the risk statistics, just to make a point that we really keep trying to emphasize, which is that encountering risk is not necessarily the same as being harmed. And the child's right to protection is the child's right not to be harmed. And risk is, as it were, the probability of harm, but not the necessity. And as we will also argue, and I think many in this room, that some measure of risk online is also necessary for children to learn to cope and to become resilient. So when I show the risk figures, as I will now, we must bear in mind this question of how safe we want children to be. We really want them to be protected from harms. 
we may need them to encounter some measure of risk. So these are, these are risks. In other words, did you encounter self-harm content? Did you encounter suicide content, hate speech, violent content, sexual content? And now you can see the range of countries. We don't have data from all 11 countries here, but from a good spread of countries. And we should emphasize that these are the statistics for children who use the internet in the country. And that is also different. So in Italy, internet using children is nearly everybody. In South Africa or Ghana, it is not. It's a minority. It's a, it's a, a, a fraction of the children, not um, all the children. In earlier EU Kids Online research, we found that when we ask children, actually they are concerned about a very wide range of risks, but sexual content and violent content have often come um, near the top. So the, as we said, children are most often using the internet at home, um, and parents and caregivers play a really crucial role, as children tell us in the survey, as well as um, the way in which their role is positioned in policy. So we have done a lot of exploration in the full report, which those of you who are statistically minded might enjoy reading. Um, but the summary is really to try to understand what can parents do, because when parents are uncertain about the, and ang anxious about the internet, their instinct is often to restrict. And yet, as many policymakers and educators have tried to say, there are other things parents can do, and that they are learning to do, and we think of these as supporting activities, as enabling activities, explaining to children, sharing the experience with children, and so forth. So we're trying to open up the range of activities that parents might uh, engage in. And what we find in the research um, analysis is that when parents take a primarily restrictive approach, children engage in fewer online activities and tend to have weaker digital skills. So even though we understand parents' desire to take a restrictive approach, it has some costs. And what we've been exploring in the report is how there can also be benefits from when parents are more supportive, encouraging and enabling their children's activities, which brings benefits to their digital skills. But only, we must be honest, only slightly reduces their exposure to risk. And that's where those questions come in about resilience and how much risk it, can society tolerate uh, for children and at what point must we uh, take a more restrictive approach. So forgive me a slightly crazy uh, slide. This is my last slide and it has um, too much information on, but it really offers you a lead in to what the next session, um, the next part of the session will be about, which is who is using these findings? And in the last year in Global Kids Online, we hired an independent consultant to go to all the different countries where we'd been researching and ask the questions of the policymakers, are you using these findings? Is this any use to you? How can it um, benefit you? And this is just a snapshot of a report that we will release uh, very soon in the next month, I think, um, which offers some of the ways in which different um, stakeholder groups in our different countries say that the research has been useful to them in guiding their actions. And as you'll see, it's a bit of a scattergun. There are some who use the research to uh, inform their child protection policy, some who use it for their education policy. Um, uh, they, it gets taken up in different ways. And for the researchers in the room, you will know that research, how research is taken up is always a bit beyond your control. Um, and you have high hopes that the research will bring many benefits and Sometimes it is noticed, sometimes not. Uh, but this is where it's really important that Global Kids Online works with a multi-stakeholder network. And so in all the different countries, there are educators, child protection experts, uh, those connected to the state who are working to see that the policies developed in those countries are evidence-based. And so we hope that should we come back in five years and redo the um, the uh, assessment, we will find further benefits. So I'll um, stop at this point. I just wanted to, to give you a screenshot of the project website, the Global Kids Online website, uh, and note that it's divided in two. 
Under tools for researchers, we make all of our methods transparent and they're all available open access under a Creative Commons license. So anyone who would like to um, uh, use part of the survey or learn from our many uh, expert reports about how to do research with children, questions of research ethics with children and so forth, everything is available there. The second half is our research results, and these are fed through as they emerge under the research updates. Uh, so if I took the screenshot today, it would show our new report, um, but I haven't quite uh, did the screenshot last week. Um, so all the re research results come there, and they are also available as um, open access uh, available reports. And we invite you to uh, watch for the updates, um, join the network if you are, um, or inquire about joining the network if you're so inclined. We um, are always looking for new countries to do research. Um, and um, I'm going to look forward to the discussion that follows. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sonia, very much for, your, for this inspired, uh, insightful presentation. And I would uh, highlight the fact that this joint initiative, London School of Economics and uh, UNICEF, is a major contribution to countries willing to produce data. And the beauty of this is that we are talking about internationally comparable data, which is essential for cross-national studies. And of course, that uh, producing cross-national uh, studies is fundamental for policy making as well. So thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, with that, I would like to give the floor to Cristina Ponte, Professor Cristina Ponte from uh, Portugal, University of uh, Nova de Lisboa, uh, so that you can provide, Cristina, comments on the European report, which is the second uh, piece of uh, report that we are launching today. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank this opportunity for being here and presenting uh, the new survey of the UK Kids Online uh, and results on a generic question that is related with the topic of um, safety, let's say. Um, could you put the PowerPoint change? Ah, yeah. So um, this is the second pan-European survey. The first one was conducted in 2010, eight years ago, in a very different uh, digital landscape. And uh, as you may see, the survey now includes 19 countries, more than 25,000 children, and in 12 countries, these 12 countries that are bold um, were uh, participated also in the survey in 2010, so it's possible to make some uh, comparison of the, the results. Uh, I start with this, um, with this um, image concerning assess, as uh, Sonia said, and it's very interesting to see how this is a global trend. Nowadays, the mobile uh, use through the mobile phone is dominant, but it's not only dominant, it's constant. As we can see, in uh, all countries, the, the use is not only daily, but several times per day or all day. So there is a strong intensity of, uh, of use. Um, in France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, the average time that children report to spend online doubled when we compared with the 2010 results. Uh, moving to the questions that I would like to, to share with you, um, because uh, our uh, European report is still uh, in progress, so um, I choose this, this topic. We, in the beginning of the, the section on risks, uh, I should say, um, as Sonia presented, we share the same questionnaire, so there are much more questions on risks. There are questions on practice, op um, uh, opportunities, uh, skills, mediation, but uh, I choose this question, and this question is exactly the same that we had in 2010. It's placed in the top, in the beginning of the section uh, that is related with risks, and we ask children to um, identify, to report if uh, in the past year they have uh, felt uh, anything that uh, has bothered them or upset. And as we can see, um, 
the range from the 19 countries are very different. Uh, and they range from very low values, for instance, 9% um, uh, and in Slovakia and Germany, to 45% in Malta. And uh, in uh, Switzerland, Spain, Russia, Czech Republic, and Romania, this situation is reported by about one out of three children. Uh, in relation to 2010, these rates increased a lot in most of the countries. Um, now gender differences are low, but um, adolescents uh, report more risks than uh, uh, young children. Uh, when we look at this image, we can also see that most children report they were upset a few times a year. However, uh, the first one, the first, um, the first column, uh, to us, um, we have results from those countries where the results were higher. More than 10% of children say this happened uh, every day, uh, on a daily basis. So this is something that um, it's interesting to, to pay attention. Following this um, question, this general uh, question, we ask two uh, subsequent questions about how children that reported they were bothered with this situation scoped with risks. Who children talked after this situation? As we can see, we have here different kind of people. And interestingly, uh, there are some common trends very visible in the results that are uh, signed Head. These results show more than 20% of children answering that they choose uh, one of these persons. This is, of course, a multiple choice answer. And we can see that uh, at the top, we have peers and parents. Uh, peers uh, in seven countries are reported by, by more than half of the old children. And parents are reported in two countries uh, France and Croatia by more than half of children. So we can see the relevance of the of peers, of friends of uh, their own age. We can also see that an, uh, another adult they trust is also um, expressive. In two countries, it reached more than 20% in Spain and Poland. Uh, and on the other side, teachers, um, professionals, and someone else uh, present quite low uh, results. Interestingly, the last column, uh, it's the column where children sign they didn't talk to anyone. And as we can also see, almost 20% uh, of children uh, are in this position. So it's something that, uh, uh, and in several countries, this position is quite, uh, is relatively high. Another point that I would like to show is another question related with this coping is what they do when they found a bothering situation. And three uh, reactions are at the top. First, they close the window or the application. Second, they ignore the problem or, or opt uh, it would go away by itself. And with the same value, we have blocked the person from contacting me. So this, in this third question, in this third answer, we clearly identify that is a contact risk. In the other situations, we, don't, we cannot identify what is happening. Could be publicity, could, uh, could be advertisement, could be um, several things. But it's interesting also that um, some um, advice that children um, are told in the, these years, for instance, uh, changing privacy settings receives 14% uh, of attention, and um, report the problem online receives only 12%. So this is, uh, these are also uh, numbers that um, invite to our uh, attention. So to finish, um, I have three kind of questions that I would like to share with you. First is uh, uh, a question about the, the possible relation between uh, the new constant access through smartphones and the increase of negative online experiences uh, in general that children report. What kind of problems bother children online when they are using mostly mobile phones 
to assess the internet, um, did new problems arise with this use? The second question is regarding abuse, um, let's say, unwanted contacts, contacts that uh, the children uh, are not happy with them. So blocking the person is at the top, but uh, we have relatively low rates of reporting abuse or changing privacy settings. And I leave the questions, are these technical solutions not seen as efficient by children, or uh, they have already privacy settings? Uh, the third question is related with factors and actors of trust. As we see, um, trust is very relevant in their relation with peers, siblings, parents, and other adults. So it's not a problem of a generational gap because parents and other ad adults they trust are um, recognized as uh, people they want to talk, uh, they want to share this experience. On the other side, teachers and professionals that deal with children are less reported. And uh, I asked, uh, why is this happening? Is due to their voices of authority? Is due to the gap between the ICT curriculum and children's digital practice? Do, uh, is, due to, is due to the school culture against smartphones that we see in several countries uh, um, in Europe? Um, why? Uh, so many children do not talk with anyone. Uh, do they feel guilty because they have experienced this bad situation? Does it depend on the bothering situation they are considering, they are thinking uh, in the moment of the, the question? Um, and on the other side, we also see the relevance of the peer-to-peer -peer mediation and training. And uh, one good example is the European School Net, the program on digital leaders that uh, has shown how uh, a peer-to-peer -peer training uh, is um, relevant for uh, um, children. So um, the full report is coming soon, and I hope that these questions show the relevance of having updated research that uh, is very useful for stakeholders, different stakeholders, including, including children and families, and also to policymakers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, very much. Uh, from this report, we can see that we have uh, similarities in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, taking advantage of the opportunities, and also how uh, children are uh, being mediated by their parents. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Daniela Truku from the UN uh, ICLAC, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, to show us a little bit uh, the results of six countries that we have been uh, collecting data in Latin America. So as I mentioned before, after uh, Europe, Brazil was the first uh, country outside Europe to produce regular data, comparable data, and the network in Latin America, network of researchers, uh, has increased very, very fast, and today we have already uh, reports for uh, six countries, and we have some, maybe two or three more uh, in the process planning uh, the survey. Daniela, you have the floor. Is there a problem? <laughs> With the, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm here representing uh, several institutions and researchers, several of them are here. Um, it's, it's a report that we're having for four countries, not six yet. Uh, we, we're probably launching it soon, January, February, uh, but we, we're in the editorial process and have much of the results here. Uh, there we go. Before beginning, um, I, I just want to um, tell you some of the specific characteristics of the context of Latin America, um, different from other parts of the world. In the first term, inequality is one of our main characteristics as a continent. Um, and then global changes driven by technological development and digitalization occur in, in this context of historical inequality, which structure the different areas and life experiences. The expansion of the digital age has been accompanied by the digital gaps that widen existing inequalities in relation to access to information and knowledge, make it even more difficult um, for the social inclusion of part of the population. 
and limits their ability to develop basic skills for full participation in current societies. That's one of, of our characteristics. The other one is um, that education, education policy, has played a, a key role in equalizing digital opportunities in this region. And then the third one that I, I, I would like to show is that um, given our levels of access to, to internet, uh, there, there's a very high level of participation in social networks in, in general for the population that, that's special from Latin America. I'm gonna, since we have 10 minutes, um, I'm gonna focus on the main findings and policy recommendations of the report. Um, the report's gonna be online with all the findings, but I'm just gonna show some data and the, and the main policy recommendations. In the first place, um, material access is still an issue in these four countries, uh, despite the advances in, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Despite the advances in the access gaps to the digital world, promoted in particular as, as in the global trends uh, by the massification of mobile connectivity, considerable gaps remain. Mobile connectivity has diversi diversified the types of access available, allowing more free and permanent connection, what we have called ubiquitous access, meaning that you can have constant access everywhere. You can see that in this graph, the prevalence of material access modalities that, that we found in these four countries. Most of, of the kids that are connected still access at home, um, um, by the cell phone, which is the most limited access that we find. And then the, the, the above part of the, of the columns show um, children accessing, having a constant access either by the cell phone or by a multi-device. But it's, few, it's a few part of the population connected that have these types of access. And we see in, in the report um, that it, the, the, the constant access has important implications for the opportunities and participations of new gen generations in the, in the digital world. Beyond where and how much the internet is used, the type of activities that children and adolescents carry out is also unequal. And this results in divergent opportunities to participate to participate in the digital society. So it is key also to advance at the same time in those gaps related to digital skills that facilitate the real ownership and benefit. And here, um, consistent with a, with a global report, parent and adult mediation is a central factor. Um, the results of the study show that the use of the internet in schools varies widely between countries. Uh, you can see in the graph, m mainly they access uh, at home, but there's also a big uh, proportion of, of, of kids that access internet at school, but it's, it's different in each country. Even though, um, and in, it illustrates the importance of the educational policy implemented in some of them. Even though education policies in these countries have moved from an emphasis in providing access to equipment to a focus on skill development, there is still a long way to go in terms of strengthening the schools and teachers' roles in this process. Um, however, digital policies for children cannot be restricted to the education sector, which has been the tendency in this part of the world. Uh, using the, the participation scale developed by Kids Online that Sonia also talked about at uh, the latter, results are consistent with the global findings in terms of a more common use of internet for socialization and entertaining activities, as well as educational learning in this part of the world. But citizenship and community activity are less common, suggesting the importance of mediation roles to promote a full inclusion in taking advantage of the, of the opportunities of the digital world, especially in these times where there's a, um, the, the social networks have played a key role in many of the social movements that are going on in Latin America right now. This poses a significant challenge to the policies in charge of training future citizens and promoting their active participation, information, evaluation of, of news and, and, and critical information. Also, during childhood, this process is mainly played at home. How do we involve parents 
um, and assess their own needs related to digital skills. And that's also part of an important um, social inclusion policy question in order to reinforce mediation strategies. Um, exposure to risk is also evaluated, as you know, in the studies. Um, and here I show just one, one of, the, of the indicators that are evaluated in, in, in these types of questions, and is um, children and adolescents that have been contacted online by a person they did not previous, previously know uh, in the last year. According to age, you can see that it's more common as, as, as children grow, grow older. Exposure to risk is considerably extended in the population study, with particular emphasis on adolescents, particularly women in some of these countries. However, as sensitive as these issues may be, the situation is rather of risks and not of damage per se, as Sonia mentioned earlier in the Global Trends too. The greater exposure to the internet undoubtedly increases the risk, but also, and consistent from what we've said before, uh, also the opportunities for greater use of the benefits of the digital area and the opportunities to develop the skills required to participate fully. Thus the importance of providing children with the tools and capabilities so that in case of facing situations of risk, violence, or need for self-control, they can make informed decisions, use self-care and protection strategies, as well as have the confidence to discuss these issues and their effects with close adults. On the other hand, it is also essential to move forward in comprehensive policies that include different sectors involved and regulate the protection of users, especially in the framework of children, children's rights and the responsibility of the private sector in the protection of personal data that has been discussed in several of the, of the meetings we've had in this forum already. Um, and finally, I want to show you the book contents that uh, is going to be available soon. Uh, we have a first chapter with regional policy and statistics, like the context of Latin America. And then we analyze uh, with, the, with the kids online data, um, material access, which I showed some of the, the results here, the educational context, the school use and teacher mediation, participation of children and adolescents in the digital world, more centered in, in citizenship, online risk management and self-care, and finally a closing section with the main challenges that have been discussed here in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. This is very interesting because uh, we are talking about four countries that have uh, comparable data. And when we look at the role of teachers and educators in the schools, you can uh, associate the results of public policy, like uh, in Uruguay, where the proportion of children uh, accessing internet in the school is higher than the other three countries because Uruguay has a very uh, solid uh, policy uh, fostering ICT in education with a Plan Ceibal, and you can see the result of the policy reflected uh, on this data. So uh, with that, I think that we saw the results for 11 countries in the report uh, of Global Kids Online, launched today. We see uh, results of uh, 19 countries in Europe, uh, reporting coming soon. And also, we see the results of four countries in Latin America. Also, the report will be soon available uh, online. And with that, having seen now all these statistics, uh, I would like to ask you to keep the, your questions for the last part, uh, for the second after the second part of the session. And now we are going to move uh, to a, a more uh, open debate on the implications of uh, data production in the policy making process that guarantees children's rights. And with that, I would like to uh, ask our colleague Guilherme Canella from UNESCO Montevideo office to give us a broad perspective in terms of policy making. And uh, I also would like to highlight that uh, in Latin America, we have uh, three very important organizations that are giving support, including financial support for the conduction of those uh, surveys being uh, uh, UNESCO, 
UNICEF, and also UNICLAC. Those three organizations, they have the legitimacy to uh, establish a dialogue between data producers and uh, policymakers. So I would like to thank very much UNESCO, UNICEF, and uh, UNICLAC for this uh, support. Uh, Guilherme, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexandre. Good, mo good afternoon to you all. Um, first, I would like to thank you very much, Alexandre, you and your team for putting this together. You know that you did all the work. We are just sitting here, but you do all the, the bureaucracy with IGF. So that was really good for us to be here. Um, I would like to start with a story. Many years ago, I was invited to a famous Spanish painter Juan Miró's exhibition. And they had an experiment. There was the paintings of Miró, and we, have, we were behind those glasses that people can see us, and they invited some adults to, to go to see the paintings, and then they started asking a few questions. But basically the questions were how complex the, the, the adults saw, uh, thought those painting, those paintings were. And they started with those kind of comments, oh, this is very easy, look at this, it's just a risk, and this guy's saying this is a bird, and whatever, no? And then after the adults left, they invited the children of these same adults to, uh, to the, the paintings without the parents, and we were there, and they started doing similar questions to the children. And the children started saying, oh no, this is very difficult. I couldn't do this. Look at this, it's so good. How can we do something like this? And really things like, seems like a bird. So uh, many times what we do in the adult world is this. We think that the children uh, behave or they think so about some of those issues in a given way. Uh, but very often it's not like that. So first, key element for policy making, and we in this IGF, we are lucky that we have lots of lawmakers here, we have judges, we have international lawmakers here. It's very important to listen to what the children have to say about those issues. And I think uh, this is perhaps the most important result of EU Kids Online, now Global Kids Online, and Latin American Kids Online, that is, offering to policymakers and lawmakers the perspective from the children with solid quantitative data, but also with some qualitative studies that can help this. Second element, uh, media in general, but also us as human beings, we are very much interested in disgrace, you know, in risks, in harm. And there are reasons for that. We don't cover as journalists every plane that takes off well or that lands well, but when a plane crashes, we cover it, because that's life. So when we talk about harm, when we talk about fear, when we talk about risks, inevitably, this calls attention. And if there is a case of revenge porn that leads to the suicide of a teenager girl, or if there is a case of a awkward game that generates some problems, this will call the attention of politicians. This will call the attention of, the, of decision makers. And we can't refuse that there, is, that there are problems, that there are risks, that there are potential harms. So that's why, again, these kind of data, are, it's very, very interesting because we need to tell the politicians, the lawmakers, and the decision makers, yes, but be careful. These cases might not be the overall picture. So here you have solid evidence to take your decisions, how to deal to the particularity of this damage, but also how to deal with a broader perspective of policy in addressing those risks, but with an overall perspective that our challenge is to mitigate the risks, but also to leverage the opportunities. We can't see this problem only from the risk perspective or only from the harmful perspective. We also need to see this from uh, the opportunities perspective um, in this case. So this is the second point that uh, Sonia and the others already explained. The, the, the data offers this. They are not neglecting the side of the protection, of the risks, even the harms that actually happen, 
But this is only one part of the story. The element of opportunities, of a rights-based approach, as including the children in the center of this discussion, uh, is in the very heart of the approach of the EU Kids, Global Kids Online, and Latin America Kids Online perspective. Third element, the idea of that you guys have to do this in networks is also very important, because this issue is more and more a common problem with, of obviously, regional and national particularities. But the opportunity for showing to policy makers, or even to us international bureaucrats, as is my case, that this is not something that is unique to the particular country or a particular constituency, that there are, there are discussions, that there are communalities in, on how children are dealing with those issues, but there are also differences. This is very important, not with the purpose of ranking countries, but with the purposes of showing that different countries are finding uh, interesting, creative solutions, but also are doing bad things in terms of policy. So we need to uh, take, take stock of the good things, of the good practices, and avoid the mistakes that some are doing in addressing those issues. And the other network effect of this discussion and the, the data that you are showing is that we can put people that normally don't talk together. Because it's not the case that in the countries you don't have policymakers and decision makers doing the promotion of rights side of the story. They are doing education authorities, Plan Seibal in Uruguay and whatever. But then you have law enforcement people, prosecutors, that are doing the harm, fighting against harm, prosecuting crimes, part of the story. What is the big issue here? They don't talk to each other. So you have the people doing their children's rights, putting children in the center, promotion opportunity side of the story, and then you have the law enforcement, child protection, etc. But these people are not seeing that this should be seen, this should be noticed and, and, and produced as a comprehensive and coherent set of policies instead of isolated initiatives trying to tackle the different parts of this puzzle. So uh, one of, for me, one of the beauties of Kids Online is that you put this together in the same report. We are not showing only the risks, only the opportunities, and calling the attention for this. So this is my, my fourth element of this discussion. But even though there is something that is missing here, uh, unfortunately, with even us being the 30th anniversary of the convention, that is, uh, reinforcing, hang, enhancing, and fostering freedom of expression for the children, uh, freedom of information for the children. And internet offers here a unique historical opportunity for children to uh, exercise those rights without the mediation of the adult world. And, and this is really the first time in history that this is possible, and we need to go deeper in this possibility. And in fact, children can help a lot uh, in, producing, uh, in producing better policies if we include them in the discussion and we respect their freedom of expression and their need to access to information to take decisions. The, other element that is very important, Sonia already mentioned it, is that this can help a lot to enhance resilience. And those data needs to offer to the politicians, to the policymakers, this idea that policies uh, to address those issues should include this component, how we enhance resilience. And this has to do with the already said combination of risks and harms and how they cope with risks, et cetera. No? And then there is a point that it's my suggestion, perhaps for, for future uh, uh, developments of this, it's money. We need to talk about money. We need to talk about budget. We need to talk about how uh, he showed me a two-minute sign, and then now please conclude. So I don't know if I, I forward in time, and I had a kind of Einstein bridge problem here, or, or it's just an. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when I mentioned budget, he said, no, this guy is going to ask me money again. Um, 
And, 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 and then I will tell you a, a final anecdote, and then I, I had a third one, but then we can discuss it during. In, in Brazil, in some point, seven, Brazil is a federate country, no 27 states, 17 assemblies of those states approved laws forbidding the use of cell phones in classrooms. On an average uh, count, producing a law like that costs like $1 million. No, all the staff time, congressman, congresswoman. If those people had invested $17 million in producing research to understand what is the best way of having cell phones in classrooms, this would be so much smarter than forbidding the story. I'm not saying there is not issues in having cell phones in classrooms. But the question is, what is the best way to address it? And again, solid data, evidence-based data can talk about that. But we need to talk about money. We need to talk about budget, because otherwise uh, policies are, all these recommendations, et cetera, are very beautiful. But uh, how we put that in, in, the, in the most important element of having this in a public policy, that is the budget law every year. So congratulations again. It's, Really always a pleasure to be with the Kids Online family. Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme. It took, me two, it took you two minutes to see my two minutes note, so immediately I had to put, please conclude. That's the reason. You should have looked to me before. Well, uh, now we are going to give the floor to Alejandra Eramuspe de Ahesic. Uh, which is the National Agents for Electronic Government in Information Society and Knowledge at, uh, from the Government of Republic of Uruguay to give us a perspective from Uruguay how you are dealing the data and policy making, how do you put this into the process of policy making. You have the floor. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers to be uh, here, to Uruguay be part of this panel. I'm here in behalf of the team who work hard in Kids Online in Uruguay. Let me mention of the people, uh, some of the people involved in this project, like Matias Dodel and Cecilia Hughes, perhaps all of you know them, uh, and Susana Dornel. For those of you who don't know, you, uh, who don't know Uruguay, let me introduce in a few words, Uruguay. It's a small country in South America. Let me see. Uh, it's a high-income economy. OK, I, I, I think I, I can. I don't know. OK, thank you. When compared to other countries in the region, Uruguay stands out of, for its political, social, and economic uh, indicators. We can also say that Uruguay is a small but digital country. Based on a medium and long-term vision that considers that digital development is not neutral, the government set out to reduce all digital gaps. The paradigms of all the technological development that Uruguay has experienced in recent years is based on inclusion and equity, like you see in, in these indica indicators we select to put there. Today, we can say that Uruguay has good conditions to address the challenges of the information and knowledge society. Uruguay has also a long and rich tradition of studies, measurements, and official statistics, serious and reliable historical trends, but not specifically about this population. This study, Kids Online, was the first one done in children in, in, in Uruguay. In this regard, this study is integrated and contributed in significant terms, and that what is was perfectly well welcomed by the whole community. It was implemented in a multi-stakeholder manner, such as the implementation of digital policy in the country. That are all the, uh, the indicators we have. Um, a remarkable aspect of this study is that all the institutions participate in the whole process, in the whole process, in the processing, in the analysis, in the, in the design. The, and the final report is a consensus document from all the participants. That is so important for us. The organis eh? Yes, I suppose. Yes. It's okay. There. 
uh, the organizations that participate in the study were UNICEF, um, uh, UNESCO, AGESIC, Plan Saibal, the university, the Catholic University. I don't know if you, all of you know Plan Saibal, or mentioned, you mentioned already. Um, plan Saibal is an organization set up in 2007 as a plan for inclusion and equal opportunities with the objective of supporting Uruguayan education policies with technology. Uh, we can add, um, getting back to the kids online, we can add that the study in Uruguay had very many interesting findings and allows us to reflect upon on what lies ahead. We can summarize the, the, summarize the key findings of this study as follow. All children connect to the internet increasingly using individual devices. Second, children recognize their difficulties in regulating internet use, but see the same difficulty in adults. Parents have little knowledge about the contact their children make with strangers on the internet, both in case of virtual and face-to-face -face contacts. And the, in the fourth, uh, fourth, opportunities and risks seem to go hand to hand in Uruguay internet use. This study has been taken as an input to enhance the exchange and contribute to the strengthening of public policy for inclusion and digital development that the country already has, as well as those that are under development. I go ahead. Uh, as you know, the challenges uh, in this area include not only children, but also teachers and families, the entire uh, educational community. One of the main aspects is to prepare children to obtain the greatest benefits from the digital society. How to prepare them to know how to do, what they do, what they know how to do, and what they can learn, also taking into account that their, their rights are not violated. Besides, we are clear that the ecosystem of applications and devices uses affect the type of activities being carried out. The type of skills acquired is what determines what educational, social, labor opportunities they will have in the future. To address this, the formal education has already incorporated resources developed for the teaching and learning model, Seibal in English, a laboratory of educational technologies that includes teaching program, robotics, 3D modeling sensors, a platform for practice maths, Seibal Digital Library, free access to more than 3,000 digital resources, but it's not enough. We still have to add in the curriculum of the basic formal education contents that attend the digital formation. Kids Online also highlights the need to train in cybersecurity and online risks. Regarding this, there are already dissemination and awareness campaigns such as Seguro Te Conectas and Tus Datos, Tus Datos Valen, Security and Privacy, developed from the, in the country. But also because children have high levels of exposure to ICTs, like you know, and autonomy of use, it's necessary to have a critical approach. For that, we move in our campaigns from specific topics, data protection or cybersecurity, to a comprehensive approach, being a digital citizen. This aspect have not yet been incorporated as a specific content in the basic formal education curriculum. That is still a challenge for us. Regarding teachers, Kids, in Euro, Kids Online in Uruguay shows that teachers have a main role as promoters of safe use and to motivate children to explore and learn. It is important that adults get involved in what children do on the internet, shortening their distance and avoiding thinking that they know more about it than that we do. There is a wide range of continuing education courses for teachers in the use of technology in educational fields, but they are optional. What does it mean? Is these courses does not accumulate merits for the teaching career. It is still necessary that this process of training in new technologies in education be formally and explicitly incorporated into the curriculum of teacher training. Today is voluntary, not mandatory. 
another initiative we have from AGESIC, working, working together with the Plan Saibal and National Public Education Administration, is replication networks to work with teachers and trainers. These net networks are mainly aimed to teachers from school, high school, and non-formal education. Includes face-to-face -face training with delivery of teaching material to work in class, courses online on issues related to digital citizenship and the Digital Citizenship Conference. So far, in 2019, 4,500 teachers and trainers were reached. Another initiative is a digital citizenship library. You have the links there to, to access to these uh, initiatives, including printable materials like teacher's guides, user information, game for children and adults, awareness posters. It also has online course, courses on public information access and data protection. I, I brought some materials here if you want to look, to take a look. Regarding families, Two minutes. Regarding families, parents. First of all, I should say that Uruguayan po digital policy has been successful in adult digital literacy. But it's necessary to work on the development of meaningful skills so that they can accompany the protection of children's rights online. Awareness action are developed with the community, family, teachers in training, students, and teachers. One of the awareness actions developed is through the Educational System Monitoring Platform. Guri is the name of this platform. Where, among other things, students' performance information, like attendance, schooling, evaluation, is managed. Parents, to get informed about their children's performance in a school, in the public school, must access that platform. Then it is used as an information channel for these topics. We also developed a media campaign to raise people awareness about digital citizenship. In these videos, many, many different persons give their opinions on topics about information society and the use of ICT. But we must recognize that the strategies deployed to address this are still very marginal. Although we are a small country, we would say that here there is a problem of scalability of the actions developed. This is a challenge for politics in the next period. In this sense, if we had to choose a group of priority adults, adults or to jump to another stadium, they should be the responsible adults of these children. To close, let me say that Kids Online in Uruguay is part of a long road, not destiny. Surely, new problems will appear in the short or medium term, establishing periodic monitoring mechanisms to study the evolution of the phenomenon is a priority. We have to continue investigating for advancing in this area. In this sense, I would like to tell you that Kids Online is going to have an next measurement in Uruguay. And uh, the, the team are, are discussing uh, an innovation in the, in, in the study. The study will be in the schools with kids and their parents. The design challenge is going to be that include the parents of those same children, the pairs of parents and children. It's okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandra. Uh, it may seem that being a small country with a small population, things should be easier, but it's not, uh, it doesn't work like that. It's a matter of good uh, policies and vision that makes a, a country really uh, to develop effective policies. With that, I would like to give the floor to Amanda Third, who is the Associate Professor and Principal Research Fellow in the Digital uh, Social and Cultural Research Center at the uh, Western Univ uh, Sydney University to give uh, an academic perspective of the relevance of data and evidence in the policymaking process. Amanda, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, well, I, as someone who's not at all been uh, involved in the production of this very fine report, I'm going to spruik it very quickly. There are copies up the back on the table, uh, as, just on the right-hand side as you're leaving the room. Please do take one. It's a really good read, fantastic and full of good, good solid evidence. I think um, the words gold standard, 
rigorous quality evidence, um, best practice. These are all words that apply to, um, to the initiatives that you've been hearing about on stage today. But of course, in the world of um, policy making for children's digital practices, there is such a thing as good evidence and such a thing as bad evidence. Um, and indeed, I think over the last um, 18 months in particular, we've seen some quite spectacular interventions into, um, into mainstream policy making by very bad evidence. Evidence that is, n is based on population data sets that um, tries to establish uh, correlations as causal relations and which has been um, a primary driver of lots of knee-jerk policy making around the world including um, the, the quite phenomenal um, you know, tidal wave of um, enthusiasm for banning mobile phones in schools around the world. Um, so I do, and I do think that, you know, it's, 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 um, it's really critical that we have high quality evidence in these debates because um, I think we've seen, we've seen in, as a consequence, and I'm, you know, and I'm referring quite explicitly um, to, the, to the article entitled um, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation that went viral early last year um, as one of my key examples. But so too, you know, moral panics around things like the Momo Challenge, um, which of course um, claimed that a Japanese, you know, fiendish Japanese animation character had been spliced into children's YouTube clips and was encouraging them to all take their lives. Um, you know, reported by many reputable uh, media outlets um, all around the world and indeed I, um, I was engaged to do a piece of national policy work because the national government was, was very concerned about this phenomenon. I had to confess that uh, it, it was in fact a hoax and we had no confirmed uh, reports so that this was actually a problem. So a very, a very panicky media environment um, creating the context for a lot of ill thought out policy making. So I think there's a very, very clear need um, for, for high quality evidence. Um, I think one of the unfortunate consequences of um, the kinds of narratives that we see circulating through the mainstream media and receiving sort of feverish responses in policy making circles um, is that, is that it stigmatizes children's digital practices. And children themselves, in the work that I have done, uh, consulting children in over 60 countries now, um, children are very acutely aware that adults don't appreciate or understand their digital practices and are um, crying out for adults to trust them more deeply and to make policies and initiatives and interventions that actually resonate with their lived experience. So I think as adult policy makers and other duty bearers in this, in this field, we have a real obligation to listen very, very carefully to children and what they have to say. Um, and I think that's one of the great strengths of some of the work that you've heard about today, is that this is research with children as opposed to research on children. Um, children are very much engaged in, in these processes. And when I say that, it's not just a matter of how these teams go into the field, um, but also a matter of developing research tools in consultation with children in order that we can actually understand the range of issues that they're facing and map them accordingly and develop the right kinds of responses. So um, I note that um, the Global Kids Online survey module, um, there's you know a new, oops, a new module in development currently and uh, thank you um, and and th and that there has been some extensive consultation uh, with children in four countries to under underpin that um, leading to some interesting findings so for example um, uh, that you know as, as Sonia was mentioning earlier that the time online measure is not is not a good one to base our policy making on it doesn't correspond with children's experiences when you have a mobile phone on you most of the day, it's very hard to estimate uh, how much time you spend online. And indeed, we are corralling children into saying things they don't believe when we ask them these questions about, about their time online. Um, also, I think um, another interesting thing that came out of that is that, uh, is that children um, 
children have to do a lot of work often to get online. And this is work that's often invisible to the adults in their lives. They have to navigate uh, parental rules. They have to deal with failing batteries or old equipment or uh, these kinds of things. Um, and that actually they, ha they have developed what you might think of as a, as a skill set um, of workarounds to make sure that they can indeed get online. Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes it's really important to be talking to children and, and generating data around these things because, of course, when it comes to policy making, we need to be signing off on these issues, the very real challenges that many children uh, face around the world. Um, I think, too, um, Obviously, we've got good evidence and we've got bad evidence. And when you've got good evidence, um, it's not enough just to have the evidence, but you have to actually work very hard to activate that evidence in a range of different settings because, of course, uh, the right kinds of change for pol in policy for children and their digital media use um, requires uh, coordinated but, uh, or, or not necessarily coordinated, coordinated is ideal, um, but certainly aligned efforts from uh, multiple different directions, um, multiple different sectors. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and I think too the other thing is that children, children themselves see a very strong role, uh, not just for their governments, but also for uh, their schools, their, um, the, the NGOs that provide them with services, uh, their parents, their teachers, etc. They see a very wide range of adults as being responsible for delivering the kind of policy change they want to see. So I think all of us um, across different, uh, across different, uh, you know, who have different different responsibilities to children need to be thinking about how we uh, channel, or how we generate and then channel the right kinds of evidence into the actions that we, that we take. Um, okay, but I think also um, often there's a lot of pressure on the people who produce evidence to, to somehow also activate it. And I think there are things that we can do, and I think certainly um, some of the initiatives here on the stage have been doing that, uh, to activate that evidence, namely to invite um, multiple different stakeholders into the process of um, supporting and generating that evidence so that you prepare a platform of um, well-positioned individuals to intervene in policy, you know, to, to use that data and evidence in, in policy-making settings. And I think uh, Sonia's last slide, um, even though it was a very crowded one and difficult to digest very quickly, um, gestures towards the, the, the very real gains that come from engaging multiple stakeholders across, across these kinds kinds of um, initiatives, data gathering initiatives. Um, but lastly, I'd like to just say also that um, in our efforts to activate policy, uh, sorry, to activate evidence in uh, policy, we must also remember that children are very key agents in this process. Of course, the convention uh, stipulates that they have a right to participate in the decision-making that impacts their lives. Even so, I think many of us find it very difficult to deliver on that, on that particular right for children. Um, and so, I, you know, I think many of us are trying to experiment with different ways of engaging children. Um, in, in policy making efforts, I think uh, there is sometimes a tendency towards consultation methods that are very one-off. They go in to talk to children, um, having already predefined the questions from a very adult-centered perspective. Um, and, and they miss an opportunity, really, to, uh, to encourage children to participate in the policy-making process in a meaningful way. So I think we do need to move towards um, methods that are, consultation methods that are much less extractive, right, which don't simply see children as a resource that we need to mine for their views and their voices, but to actually think about consultation as an opportunity to encourage conversations with children, remembering that they are the next generation of change makers and that if we give them space to think about and develop um, their languages for talking about and encoding their ideas, uh, you know, if we give them that space, then we, we take a step forward to a much better future in which our policy much more uh, effectively targets the real needs of children everywhere. Thank you.
Thank you, Amanda, for highlighting the fact that we have to take into account the children's perspective, the children's voice in this uh, process. Well, last but not least, uh, we are going to listen from uh, Su Wenwing from UNICEF China to give us a more international perspective from a uh, from UNICEF perspective. Thank you, and um, I'm very privileged to uh, to be here. And uh, um, thank you for all of you who's uh, sticking around. Um, so um, first, I'm very excited to join this Kids Online family. I'm a newcomer um, because we, uh, UNICEF China, uh, in last year, we also kicked off this uh, Kids Online study. Um, but uh, uh, we actually uh, we adopted the Kids Online framework and a set of tools, questionnaires, um, etc. Uh, but it was very heavily contextualized um, because we really, you know, China is such a huge and complex country. We couldn't really do a national representative study. Um, and we are now in the final stage of uh, data analysis, and uh, the final report uh, is to be expected early next year. Um, but back to the the question about policy and you know evidence based research, we actually at the very beginning when we are de de designing this study, um, at that time there are already in China some existing uh, research and findings about uh, children's use of internet. So there are some data there already, and uh, um, we are we were we were thinking what. You know, uh, could we offer that uh, distinguish us? You know, our study from the existing ones, and because we are partnering with a Chinese research team uh, who has very uh, extensive experience um, on working with children, we decided to highlight child participation uh, in our study. Um, it was not an easy process. Um, because you know, child participation as a concept and a practice is not really embedded in the Chinese or even the East Asian culture. Because traditionally, uh, we are a society that really uh, uh, respects the elders and authority of parents, teachers, and adults are usually traditionally not to be questioned. Um, but there are still a huge appetite for young people, for children to uh, to uh, speak up, you know, to share their views. Um, the a recent example is that uh, in China they are currently revising the law on protection of minors, and uh, the draft of the revision of the law uh, was published to uh, for public to comment and uh, uh, you know. Uh, provide recommendations. Um, I forgot the exact number, but it was that that uh, the legislative branch received like uh, forty thousand comments or whatsoever, and half of them uh, was submitted by children. So they are really concerned about the laws and the policies that will have an impact on their lives. So uh, you know the the space is still there, and we uh, want to work with children, support them, empower them to uh, you know really uh, participate in the you know every step of this study. So um, at the very beginning, the designing stage, we uh, invited a group of child researchers to work very closely with us. You know, in terms of the the questionnaire design, you know, language we use, and uh, you know, several test rounds of the the questionnaires. Um, but that was not enough because, like Amanda just said, it was still sort of uh, constructed in a way that you know how. Uh, we adults think and uh, you know uh, construe things, but we want the children to have their own sort of choice of topics, and uh, so we get, we have a sort of like a parallel child-led research, and uh, our children uh, formed uh, uh, small research groups and chose their uh, research topics. 
uh, you know, uh, I, I think some of the topics are uh, online uh, gaming, online learning, online shopping, you know, the use of short videos like TikTok. Um, and very importantly, they also want to uh, look into parent-child relationships in terms of the use of the internet, which I think is very inspiring because they feel like um, that is actually at uh, the center of a lot of the issues they face. So um, they actually have some very interesting findings in those uh, parallel small-scale child-led uh, research they conducted. Um, the methodology is simple. They chose the topic, they designed a short questionnaire, and they disseminated those questionnaires in their schools, in their classes, in their neighborhoods. And uh, they collected those uh, uh, and uh, you know, do the ana analysis themselves, and they write uh, uh, reports by themselves, a very uh, you know, uh, readable, child-friendly, uh, colorful reports. And uh, um, the lot of findings in those reports are really uh, uh, very uh, inspiring, and especially, for example, in the, the parent-child relationship one, they actually listed uh, like five things they don't want to hear their parents saying in terms of uh, how they are using the internet, basically like, uh, no phone, no games, or like uh, uh, you're useless, all you do is playing, that sort of thing. And uh, um, it's actually very powerful as well, because when we, um, we haven't uh, published the result yet, but that, um, as some occasions, the like seminars, we actually ask them to share the, these findings with adults, uh, policymakers even, and the parent, their parents. And it, it was really powerful because uh, they do see the children's point of view and you, in those children's language, you know. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I'm all for evidence-based research and policy advocacy, but uh, we all know that uh, a lot of adult-driven policy agenda are you know, sometimes, like Amanda mentioned, uh, uh, you know, driven by paranoia or emotion. Um, when we look at numbers and the data, sometimes we lose interest, we stop listening. Um, but uh, with those powerful children's remarks and their views, we do get people, adults, policy uh, makers to listen. I think that's, uh, you know, what we should think about when we do this research and uh, when also about how we tell the story of our research findings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Su Wenwin. Uh, I will open the floor for two questions, very brief questions, and ask the speakers to react. Yes, we have one question here. Two questions. Thank you. Uh, to begin, I want to congratulate all of you for this excellent work you have been doing for many years. As you said, uh, all this research are very relevant for society and for police makers to enforce children's rights in digital area. And so I would like to know if you have any data about the amount of advertisement children receive in the internet and how do they feel about it? And also, I'd like to hear from Guilherme Canella if you believe marketing to kids can affect their freedom of express, especially when they are hired by companies to advertise products as digital influencers. Thank you. My question is talking about policies. This is Mauricio Hernandez from Mexico City. My question is, uh, what about um, parents and uh, education systems uh, coming from the government liability while trying to make our children learn on their own privacy? We are talking about policies, what the, what the policy shall make, shall establish, whatever. What about 
our duty as parents, as government, as schools, as a society. Yeah, hello. My name is Igor Plahuta. I'm mainly father. That's why I'm here. And uh, my question is, um, do you see the need to extend the investigation uh, on the health issue for the children? So uh, since we don't have uh, much time, I will give uh, each speaker 30 seconds to address some of these uh, issues. I will start with uh, Daniela. Okay, um, one, of the, one of the recommendations, and I'm, I'm probably addressing more the, your question, um, has to do with um, having a comprehensive policy um, articulation and coordination. Um, at least in Latin America, it has, uh, the priority has been um, in the educational sector. There's a lot to be done there in terms of um, adult mediation skills, et cetera, curriculum, um, um, uh, advancing towards a more comprehensive uh, set of skills, not only in terms of um, academic notions, but also in terms of sociability, ethics, et cetera, uh, but also in towards inclusion of um, the, the rest of the adult population that is also excluded from, from, from these processes and cannot uh, accompany kids, plus what I mentioned in terms of uh, regulation and protection and involving the, the, the private sector. In terms of the question regarding of uh, advertisement, I think the Brazilian uh, studies have more information regarding that in Le the Latin American cases. Thank you, Daniela. Christina, yes. 30 seconds. Yes, I would just uh, reply to your question about advertisement uh, to say that uh, in the Portuguese uh, survey in Kids Online, we included an open-ended question about what uh, are bothering uh, people of your age. And for our surprise, it was very interesting because this didn't happen in 2010 advertisement was placed in second. So um, we see uh, a race of um, bothering situations. Now, it's not an appeal of an advertisement. And probably this may be related with the, the access to free games, uh, the access to videos, the cookies, that uh, was the access uh, that is growing up and more frequent. So the, the digital path is becoming uh, to digital to digitalization is becoming more efficient for the monetization of this culture. But what is interesting is this is seen as a bothering situation and not an appeal to consumption. Thank you, Sonia. Um, thank you. Uh, so I think the three questions concerned with health, privacy, and marketing actually capture the areas in which we hope to be developing new modules in our survey, thinking very practically. Um, but I also, and, and we don't have direct data on those, on those questions as yet, because we really focus on what the child can say, especially about their, um, as we've said, their opportunities and their safety risks. But what I see as in common in those questions is something about the business model of the internet and the way in which it is, as it were, pushing a uh, commercial agenda, whether or not this is to the best interests of children for their health, their privacy, um, or their freedom of, of, of thought, in effect. And um, at this point, I think it, it's really important that we take the research we do have, but it must be part of a, a much wider debate and whether there can be some other business model or diversification of business models emerging. For me, that's the key policy question. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Daniel. I'll only go for the health question. Um, I think studying uh, health consequences are important, but actually I would flag that what we need more research on uh, is how, it's about how technology can be used to benefit children's health. So around positive, uh, supportive interventions through technology that can actually build uh, resilience or prevent anxiety, help children cope with depression and so on. I think that's really what we should um, be aiming for rather than to think about only the, the downsides of it because really I think if we look at the high, highest quality of research we have on this, um, it's becoming more and more clear that um, health consequences are really fundamentally related to children's offline or real lives much more so than driven by uh, things that are happening in the digital space. So more for the opportunities.
I'm, I'm happy to give you um, papers and such later. Yes, I, I would echo those comments absolutely. Um, but also, I think I think what um, your concern in particular points to is the fact that actually parents need a lot more information about the pet, about the benefits and and um, possible harms of children's engagements online. I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on parents to do the right things, but we don't always arm them with the tools that they need. And so, I think this is I think this is a really critical piece um, for policy making to address. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Uh, in Uruguay, we think all of us, governments, uh, researchers, uh, teachers, parents, all of us. Uh, have to work together, uh, shares the double responsibility to protect our kids and teens from the risk of the digital world and help each child from the promise of connectivity. Thank you, Guillermo. Very briefly, two things. On the health question, definitely more research, particularly mental health, it's, it's a very complex area. But I would flag that we need to be very careful in the participation of the pharmaceutical industry in those research because these people want to sell more drugs to the children so they are producing all sorts of uh, uh, bad research with no hard evidence on those things. On your question, Isabel, it's very complex, but what I can say and we can discuss later is that there is interesting jurisprudence that freedom of expression also encompasses the right of not saying something. You, you, you can't oblige people, even including children, in saying something they don't want, like marketing for something. So there is an interesting decision of the US Supreme Court on that. Uh, we will have a session 430 with judges from high courts, so perhaps we can discuss that in that session with more details. Thanks. Thank you, Guilherme. So the last uh, Yeah, I'm remark. just quickly also respond to the, uh, the house question. Um, first, I, I think it's uh, it just shows like uh, we, um, as parents, as adults, like children, we don't know a lot about you know this issue, and thus uh, more research is definitely needed and a good high quality research. And then uh, the second point is uh, even for this, we need to uh, communicate and have dialogue with children themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it was a real uh, great pleasure to moderate this uh, wonderful panel. And uh, I thank all the audience for staying uh, until at this time, lunchtime. This is uh, an opportunity for us to uh, raise our voices and try to uh, bring this voice and also children's voice into this debate. So with that, I would like to thank all uh, the speakers. It was a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.